okay? So I want to say just a few more things to relate this back to the cement because that's, uh, and then, I'll, then I'll, I'm just going to say a, f a few slides about this, but partly because I think it should show you how to look for commonalities in different materials at a molecular level. So we had no experience at all in cement. And it was brought to our attention, actually two years before the big Gulf of Mexico oil spill, that there was a big issue with understanding how cements crystallize in the chemistry because it was happening now under conditions which, and even though it's the most important, I think, synthetic structural material in human history, it has a very old origin. The Romans used lime and volcanic ash. White Portland cement, which is the product of probably most of the buildings and constructed in the United States, uh, at least 200 years old, there's 10 to the 10th tons consumed per year. And it's a mixture of silicates and aluminates. And some iron aluminates and other magnesium oxides and calcium oxides. They're under the same pH conditions as zeolites. So they are, these are very complicated mixtures. There's complicated silicates and aluminate structures. And they, under high alkaline conditions of pH, solubilize to different extents, and they will form silica, calcium silicate um, hydrate gels, which then cross-link to form crystalline-type compounds in hardened cement. So in some ways, it's pretty similar to zeolites. You have silica, you have soluble silica in solution species, pH is about the same, 10 or so, you have hydration products, you're hydrating, and you form crystalline materials, which are not zeolites because they don't have the quaternary ammoniums, but the same compositional aspects of additives and crystallization are both occurring. You have solubility, and you have precipitation, and you have crystallization. These crystals are different forms of normally um, silicate aluminate hydrates, or, or, or aluminate hydrates, and what they, in the, in the case of deep water oil wells, they add organic additives, such as saccharides, actually, sugars. I mean, probably because they're cheap, but they have some very surprising influences. And they adsorb on the surfaces of these particles to influence the rheology and the mechanical properties of the slurry that's, that's produced, as well as the form of the crystals that, are, 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 that result. And to give you an idea, so you form these type of structures, and this is at 95 degrees Celsius at 24 hours, pH 13. This is even higher. Hydrated white Portland cement. These are the, now, what you do is you, have, you start off with these calcium silicates. They're so-called Q0 species. The Q1 are evidence of the hydration. And you can see this because after you now have the same types of measurements, you have the silicon spectrum here and you have the proton spectrum. The proton spectrum here is simpler. You have silicon uh, silanols, and there, and water. And you see the Q0s, these are non anhydrous, very low signal from these. But the hydrated species form crosslinks, show a very high amount of interaction with water and with the silanol species. This adsorbed water being one. And then hydrogen bonded out here. So from the same type of method of the dipole-coupled 2D experiments, one can establish that, yes, these are strongly interacting with water. And, and then you can correlate it to the types of structure of these calcium silicate hydrates, which then form these cross-linked hydroxyl group species, which are the evidence of solidification. So this is what solidified cement results. It's this extended chains of cross-linked calcium silicate hydrates. And if the case there's interest, I want to draw, especially maybe to Helmut's case, this we were really surprised about. If you look at this, I've never seen a signal at minus 179 ever before. And I thought this might have been an artifact or somehow a fold back from it. And, and I called Jonathan Stebbins uh, at Stanford, who was a geologist, who basically guided me to some literature that established that this is actually six coordinate silicon, which I never heard of before, but which actually exists in the form. This is a mineral tomasite. It's a name from a 
for a German geologist from the 1920s or so, at six coordinate silicon. And so, you know, six, six coordinate silicon is not a common feature to see in a spectrum of something that is, prefers to be four coordinates. So this is, this is really unusual to see a six coordinate silicon, but there you go. And it's coordinated strongly to water. You can also use this for aluminum. And so this is tricalcium aluminate, one of the components of silicate. And what you see is, in, in the case of the proton spectrum, again, aluminum hi, hi, uh, hydroxide, adsorbed uh, water, uh, hydrogen bonded species. This is ver very uninformative. If you look at the aluminum NMR spectra up on top, silicon magic angle uh, spinning, or excuse me, aluminum magic angle spinning, you see some features, but this is also very uninformative. But with the two-dimensional method, where we do, instead of, we do the proton, cross-polarization, contact time to aluminum, and then detect the aluminum, and do the two-dimensional aluminum Fourier transform with the proton, we now have our proton signals with the aluminum, and now we see that this broad signals are actually comprised of some very specific signals from very well-resolved species in the two-dimensional frequencies. So we've done these at, in Santa Barbara, we have an eight, uh, we have an 800 megahertz instrument, so it's 19 Tesla. And using these conditions, we can get beautifully resolved signals, which now we can attribute to ettringite, which is one of the major crystalline components in cement. This is ettringite. This is the crystals I talked to you about. So there's a, they're aluminate hydrates. These long needle-like are aluminate hydrates. Monosulfate and a few others, such as these uh, octahydrates and hexahydrate species, which yield very distinct aluminum NMR signals, which now gives us great ability to then quantify, uh, resolve and quantify these in a way which gives us unprecedented insight on what the nature of the cement chemistry is. No, just no one had applied these high, uh, these very powerful two-dimensional type methods to these complicated mixtures before us. And we were motivated and been working with the cement community in order to choose conditions which made it relevant. So my last few points are that to relate this to the zeolite topic. And that's that in deep water oil wells, the temperatures are in, often far in excess of 100 degrees. So off of, offshore of Brazil, you're, pub you're pumping in approximately 7,000 meters of water. Well, excuse me, 3,000 3, meters of water and another 3,000 or 4,000 meters under the ocean floor. And so the temperatures are approximately 100 to 200 degrees Celsius. The pressures are huge, huge pressures. And since you, all of us, or many of us, are chemists here, you know what happens to chemical reaction kinetics at high temperature and high pressure? It, it goes rapidly, much more rapidly. And if you're talking about cement, the way they make a deep water oil well is, this is, is you, you make a hole, and then you pull, the, you pull the, 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 the drilling bit out, and then they, they include a pipe, a pipe that goes to the bottom. Now the pipe has to be anchored and also to seal against leakage out to the surface. Otherwise you have the problem like you had in the Gulf of Mexico in 2009. So they pump cement down the center, and it has to stay fluid, and because then at the bottom it flows up the sides of the pipe up to the top. Or, and they do this in a series of stages of about maybe 100 or 200 meter increments. So this has to remain liquid-like, and under these temperatures and pressures, there can take no risk of it, of the cement solidifying down on the way down here. Because if you submit, solidify the cement here, you've basically blocked your hole, and you've basically left the sides open, and this would be a potential disaster. So what oil companies like Halliburton and Schlumberger use, they use organic species to inhibit hydration. Hydration is, the, is what happens to the solidification. And they use things such as saccharides. In this case is like a cellulosic. This is a lignosulfonate. And what we set out to do is we set out, to, and you can see here from the viscosity, they add these hydration inhibitor, polycarboxylate, methyl cellulose, starch, other things, and you can see, for a small percent of a few, half a weight percent of these, a one weight percent, you can, the viscosity, you can keep the, thing, the materials at low viscosity so that they can be pumped as a rock liquid slurry mixture down the cement and then allow it to flow and solidify only 
after it reaches the bottom. And they use saccharides. And the question is, why saccharides? And how do they, what, 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 what counts for these differences? Because starch, cellulose, starch basically is cellulose. Carboxylate, and moreover, if we look at two model compounds that we've used, glucose is a moderate to poor inhibitor of hydration. Sucrose, of which you have a lot in Brazil, is an excellent hydration inhibitor. Like tiny concentrations stop hydration. And it's surprising, at least it was to me, because you have sucrose is composed of a glucose ring and a fructose ring. Well, I'm not going to talk about all the details of this, except only to say that what we've been investigating is how and why these additives function differently, and how they can be, how can cement properties can be, and processing can be improved. So we've been working on this. And I'm just going to conclude by showing some of the things with this last uh, slide from, from sucrose, and also to show that even if you use working on cement, you can still publish in good journals. We had this published a year and a half ago in, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Because for one, it's an important problem. And two, nobody understood how these saccharides could influence and bind to these minerals. And it turns out that I think this is important also in corrosion inhibition, inhibition as well as in how organic molecules such as sea organisms bind to structures like ship hulls and rocks. And so one of the things you can do is using the silicon NMR, the aluminum NMR, we identified these different aluminate peaks, and we could identify this as being due to aluminum hydrates. So we correlate the proton spectrum with the aluminum spectrum. We also correlate the proton spectrum with the carbon-13 spectrum of sucrose. And the, in the case of, we, we took the trouble here to isotopically enrich the, use isotopically labeled uh, carbon-13 enriched, excuse me, sucrose. So all of these different carbon sites, one, two, three, four, and so on, are all present in the sucrose. So this is a sucrose adsorbing on the surface. And what you can see is that from the aluminum spectrum, there is no adsorption and no formation of, of, on, on the aluminate hydrate species. So that, and in fact, we have separate evidence to show that this, the sucrose selectively adsorbs on silicate sites unlike glucose, which adsorbs strongly on sites like this, as well as on silicate sites. So the sucrose has a very special structure, and we, we think is happening is that, that these sites 2, 4, and 7 are the ones which actually from the, are, have, have been be some modified from the, from the original, uh, from the crystalline material, and that there's the arrangement of the hydroxyl groups is just right so that they can bind in some multiple ways to form a strong bind, bow, uh, chemical bond hydrogen bonded with the, with the surface in order to competitively prevent water from binding there and thereby stop the formation of these aluminum hydrates. And in fact, when we look at, we see some evidence of this, that if we look at this for these same conditions, we would normally see mostly aluminate hydration products. And here now we see just very, very few. We see a few, but very small in number compared to what we would if we had no sucrose whatsoever. So, the sucrose happens to be stable in alkaline condition. It absorbs weakly on these hydrated aluminates. It absorbs an intact selectively, I, I said, on the hydrated aluminates, on uh, the non-hydrated aluminates and silicates to block water for, uh, penetration. And basically, this accounts for the favorable properties of, uh, of sucrose. And I think that most sugars share some very special properties of how they interact with proteins and other biomolecules so that the saccharides are designed by nature to basically competitively interact with water at whatever surface that they will be interacting in order to preferably promote inorganic or hydration interactions in order to prevent crystallization in this case of cement or promote it in the case of surfactants and, and zeolites. And so the conclusions are that, you know, we can, if we have strongly interacting amphiphilic surfactants, we can basically promote crystallization. If we have strongly interacting saccharides, we can hinder crystallization. Interesting enough. So you're, these additives on otherwise almost identical aluminate or silicate conditions. I mean, so the choice of the organic molecule has a tremendously important role in whether you promote crystallization or hinder crystallization, or even what crystallization you, you, you end up, uh, product you end up forming. And that's because these depend on molecularly specific interactions at the inorganic surfaces or surface sites. And what 2D NMR does together with x-ray and electromicroscopy, and in some cases modeling, 
The two-dimensional NMR allows you to establish what these specific molecular interactions are in a way that I think there's no other way to do it, especially at surfaces, because the surfaces, it's the surface interactions, which actually are where crystallization and all these processes must originate. So there's, and these surfaces are not amenable to X-ray diffraction, and they're not easily seen except by, I think, 2D NMR is, is my own particular view. If there's a stronger way of seeing these, it's, uh, it's hard to it's hard, I don't know, though, know of one. And so then, from that, we can then explain how these different types of organic molecules adsorb at these inorganic surfaces together and in, comp in, in careful comp uh, comparison to understand how surfactant self-assembly can be subtly controlled to combine with framework crystallization to get the product we seek. And in the case of cement, how or, and in fact, all of these, they involve an adsorption competition between a surfactant and a solvent, water, or saccharide in water, in order to provide the exact configuration to form the crystalline products that you either want to form in the case of the zeolite or don't want to form in the case of cement. So my, my group uh, who did this, Ben Smith, he's Canadian. He just finished his PhD. He actually did the work yesterday I spoke about on semiconductor nanocrystals. He also did the work on cement. He had a really beautiful thesis. Um, Raul Sangadkar is continuing his work on cement. Ming Feng Shu worked on the mesostructured zeolites. Also, Matt Aronson is doing this. Uh, Professor Ryong Ryu and I were all, he was a postdoc at Berkeley where I did my PhD work and taught me about zeolite chemistry as a graduate student, as the, as the youngest graduate student. So I'm very grateful to him. He's now a very prominent material scientist and chemist at KAIST in South Korea. Uh, we have um, his students, Kyung Soo Na, had visited Santa Barbara when we were conducting these measurements. Uh, and uh, Aditya Rawal and uh, Sylvian Kadar were postdocs in the group. And so the funding has come from a combination of NSF for the zeolites, Halliburton, and now we've gotten also funding from the Department of Transportation in the United States because of their interest in the cement product, which has involved close dialogue with the people who care about the properties, which is Gary Funkhauser and Larry Roberts and Vijay Gupta from Halliburton and RTI International, and uh, what got us kind of involved in some of these early work uh, with David Serrano. So, obrigado, and I'd be glad to talk to you about or answer any questions. <laughs>